Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, Francis Family Foundation, John W. and FEE Spees Memorial Trust, the H&R Block Foundation, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, and viewers like you, thank you. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Maris Aylward. Welcome to the first Arts Upload of 2016, coming to you from the Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts. Can you believe it turns five this fall? It's amazing. <laughs> and, you know, while we're here, we're going to share stories about a certain ballet and trains lit up by flashbulbs. Also, Hollywood's history with Hooch and the final hours of the record bar. All ahead on the Upload. You know, Dave Burkhardt on camera there mm -hmm. uh, likes to say that there's just no bad shot to be taken <laughs> yeah. here. But part of the reason we're here this week is because it's where a certain story we've been following for months and months finally reached its conclusion. Yes, that'd be the story of how the Kansas City Ballet has reinvented the Nutcracker. We've shown you how the sets and costumes were constructed all over the country. And now this week, you'll see how the whole thing came together. Spoiler alert. It actually worked out really well, but that doesn't mean those last few weeks weren't pretty intense. Better, good, up around. The entertainment part of it for me is so important that an audience would walk away from the experience feeling like that was an experience to remember beyond the moment of the curtain going down. The raw materials for building that experience? Dancers, lots of dancers. And while nearly all the older ones at least have some nutcracker in their history, learning the steps in Devon's all new choreography is still a considerable task. Especially with a 22 performance run, which means everyone will learn multiple roles. With the opening curtain just three weeks away now, Maybe nothing says crunch time at the Bolander Center better than this. There's just a lot of moving pieces that we're starting to put together. I mean, in one day I will run six or seven different parts. The other day I ran six before lunch. You constantly have to know what part you're doing and be ready for that one. And I think he has done a very good job of making sure that we don't get overwhelmed by the sets and the costumes, that it's still about us. But the buzz around this new Nutcracker comes in large part from the visual treat its makers have promised. This rainy Monday morning, trucks hauling sets and scenery from four different construction sites have docked at the Kaufman Center. So stage crews can start piecing the spectacle together. Forty-eight hours later, finds racks and boxes filled with newly sewn costumes, offloaded and unpacked in the Bolander's basement. For Ricky Lurie and Jennifer Carroll, the scene feels a whole lot like Christmas morning. Here's a girl one, and they have different colors inside their ears. More snow. She ruched all the trim, and we're very, very pleased. So yes, the tutus, vests, coats, and hats all look great to the naked eye. But on stage can be another matter. Hence this afternoon's costume parade, under the watchful eye of Holly Hines, the woman who drew them up in the first place. It's also the first time dancers and the staging have met face to face. We go from flat to a mannequin to on a dancer and they have to be able to move and that can't be restrictive. And then you get on stage, now all of a sudden you're sitting back in row R and maybe you can't see the buttons or there isn't any sparkle. You're not done till you're done. 
was really exciting. And you could sense that energy in the dancers. They were having a great time. It was like show and tell. Oh, wow, look at your jewels. And yeah, look at my hat. And you know, it, it was kind of cool. I love that. The credits on Holly's resume confirm she's one of the very best in the business. Not unlike the tall Frenchman, she coaxed into doing the scenic design. Though in recent years, Alain Vaez has focused more on children's books and exhibitions of his paintings. This is my first project in, uh, in 10 years. I was totally thinking I was never going to design again. And here I am, the bug, the bug came back. I've been working hard for uh, the best of the last eight months. And if it pays off, I mean, it's just, I'm really pleased. There are all these puzzles. There's this costume puzzle, there's this scenic puzzle, there's the prop puzzle, there's the choreography puzzle, um, and it's my job to put all those pieces together. I'm the one that makes the costume go with the set and the prop look dimensional when it's flat and the choreography to pull the focus to where Devin wants the focus to be. Trad Burns has been Devin's go-to guy for making lighting magic on a number of productions in recent years. As for the Nutcracker, he lit his first one at 22. It's safe to say he's seen it performed many times since then. Everybody had opinions about what they felt worked and didn't work with Nutcracker, and it's really great that we all could come together and come to agreement about what things we felt were important to include and not, and that brings it to a very different level. It's not together. It's, I mean, we're not, it's not like complete. You know, but we have the parts now and they're all in the same place, which is really, wow, it's just like something's coming soon, you know? It is so close. How close is it? Well, at this point, only nine days remain to get the balloon working, Drosselmeyer flying, all the entrances and exits smoothed out before members of the Kansas City Symphony slide into the pit for dress rehearsal. Yeah, I feel the weight of it, but I also know that this is an A-team between sets, costumes, lighting, the dancers, they are bringing their best work to the table. So you can't go wrong with that. Yes, am I nervous? Yes, am I, am I anxious? Yes, am I getting no sleep? I mean, all those things are certainly a part of my life right now. The sounds of Tchaikovsky's score pouring into the hall adds another important ingredient to that experience Carney's seeking to build. Flowers waltz. Clara and the party goers party heartily. Mice get rowdy and mayhem ensues. And perhaps most impressively, the forest fills with snow. Snow is my favorite section. To me, it's an important moment. It's the first time that we're really, truly in a different world. Every time Devin comes in and says, well, this balloon's going to come down during snow and take up the prince, I'm like, oh, my kids are going to love that. Like, there's always that. I'm thinking about what my children will think about it, and I think they're going to be blown away. It's really about one day at a time and just taking it one eight counts at a time and knowing that the larger picture is going to be good because of all this incredible talent that we've got. This is the night the long countdown ends, bringing with it another key ingredient, audience energy. It's a full house, complete with lots of notables on hand, including Julia Irene Kaufman and Mayor Sly James. There's outgoing County Executive Mike Sanders, and yes, that's Mark Wahlberg from Antiques Roadshow. Turns out his daughter Goldie joined the company this year. Many have donned their holiday best, and nearly all are primed to be part of something that's never been seen before. There's no more time to sew, there's no more time to paint, there's no more time to readjust the scenery or move a spike mark a little bit and move that chair one more inch this way. It's going to be what it's going to be. That gave me a bit of weakness in my knees at that moment, it really did. 
The applause that greeted the opening curtain erupted again and again throughout the night. From the workshop scene to the Rat King's dramatic demise. Through flurries of snowflakes and on to gymnastic Russians, fluorescent Chinese, shepherds and some very cute sheep, the sugar plum fairy, of course, one last goodbye to the balloon, and finally a thunderous curtain call for the entire cast and creative crew. Upstairs in Brandmeier Hall, the post-production party offered food, drink, and the chance to let off some steam. And also we got to go upstairs. By the time Jeff Bentley arrived, the executive director was almost walking on air. It was everything we wanted it to be in terms of audience response, in terms of, you know, we've already, as of today, we've just opened this show. We made our goal, our revenue goal, for the production. We've never done that before. Beautiful, wonderful. I think it's engagingly fresh. I think it's charming. But, I mean, the focus of it is the classical ballet that this company does so well. Great box office, consistently good reviews, a boost to the company's image outside Kansas City. By most any metric, this huge endeavor was a huge success. Still, you have to wonder, is its chief architect already dreaming up changes for 2016? It's only within my nature as a, a closet engineer to want to try and make it work better. Will I change the order of the show? No. Will I change Drosselmeyer and, and make him some old, decrepit man? Probably not. Will I make Clara an 18-year-old on point who dances her way through the whole show? No. The core of the show would, I, don't, I think we, we got it pretty good on the first time up to bat, so yay, you know? <laughs> In case you missed some of the earlier glimpses behind the scenes, it's all available at our website. We call it Resetting the Stage. And you know, in about three weeks, the company will be right back here to perform maybe the world's other best-known ballet, Swan Lake. Okay, remember the Royals Parade? Well, of course you do. And those awesome pictures of the crowd? The photographer was Roy Inman. He worked for years for the star and has done some very cool things with Union Station, which might help explain his fascination with trains. And flash bulbs, the old-fashioned kind, which he uses with an army of volunteers to take some unique railroad portraits. Julie Denishay has a story from Baldwin City, Kansas. Okay, ready? Countdown. Three, two, one. One went right there. One went. Top right. That's yeah, right. one bulb went. <laughs> one bulb went. That was impressive. That was badass. Some might ask why we use flash bulbs instead of strobe. Well, number one, it's an homage to Winston Link, one of our heroes. Number two, the amount of strobes it would take to replace a single number 50 flash bulb, it would be like 10 strobes to replace it. And uh, for the jazz, man, because uh, it's just living on the edge. It's just a real rush. And when you get too close to the bulbs when they go off, sometimes the hair will stand on the back of the neck because they ionize the air when they fire. And there is, ooh, ooh, there is a used feller. See, there's not much. See there? He's hot. He's warm. Whew, it's hot potato. That's what it looks like afterwards. And it's no good. One shot, that's it. Boom. Right, and that, uh, that old Pullman car would be, would be ideal right behind it. Uh, and I suppose it might be interesting to throw the caboose on. All right. All right, thank you, sir. We'll see you about seven-ish. Okay, I got the two I think a lot of people are fascinated with the past, and I sure am. And it's a, it's a connection with trains, and it's a connection with uh, photographic techniques of the past. A lot of photographers, serious photographers, do old-fashioned techniques that go back a hundred years or more. And this is kind of in that vein too. There's just something interesting and unique and challenging about it. It's just pure fun. I'd always been interested in trains like most guys of my generation I had Lionel Train running around the tree when I was a kid. I began to realize just how significant 
railroads were in the development of the United States. As I'm looking around to try and find old uh, photos and old artifacts, I discovered the work of O. Winston Link. From 1955 to 1960, he documented those last years of steam railroading on the Norfolk and Western Railroad. It was the last railroad in North America to run steam on the main line. And the only way he could figure out to do it at that time was to use flash bulbs. And he didn't just photograph just the trains. He wanted to include the environment and to capture some of the era too, which he did. In the spirit of old Winston Link, I like to put the train in context with the depot, with the surrounding area. And another thing, of course, that we can do now that, that could not be done before is color because color films were so primitive back in the 50s. In 1950, 95% of people had ridden a train. The only contact most people have with a train now is when it slows them down at the railroad crossing. So it's also a way of connecting the past with the future and to show how spectacular and interesting and dramatic trains can really be. That'll do. Okay. That'll do. Why are you going to analyze on the front? Flash bulbs are so powerful uh, for the size and weight. Screw them in. That's it. Just, just make sure they're screwed down dead home to their stop. But you have to have so much energy stored in that bulb, which turns into heat and light. When they go off, you can be standing five feet away and you still feel the heat from those bulbs. Extremely hot, a lot of energy expended in a very short amount of time, which of course is what you want for photography. But to get them to do that, especially bulbs that are 50, 60, 70 years old, you know, takes, takes a little bit of doing. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and shoot. To actually make a photograph, to take a scene and visualize it and, and have to put all the lights and all the wherewithal and get the angles, etc., and get all this into gear and then getting assistants that are motivated and really want to help and make it work and then put it all together, it's, it's like a, a small movie production. And I say when it works, man, is magic. The name of the show is Arts Upload, and it's our way of proving that Kansas City is America's creative crossroads. But we also like to share other stories from around the country, like this next one from Southern California. You know, with the Oscar nominations just out, I'm guessing a number of cocktails may have been <laughs> sipped in celebration or perhaps to drown out the sorrows of rejection. Author Mark Bailey has compiled a new book about cinema's golden age and the epic imbibing that often accompanied it. It's called Of All the Gin Joints, Stumbling Through Hollywood History. Here's a few of the tales. Nothing like sitting at a bar to inspire a book or two about drinking drinks and the drinkers. Good Friends writer Mark Bailey and illustrator Edward Hemingway, grandson of Ernest no less, did just that. And nothing like an old Hollywood hangout is the perfect place to tell tall tales and talk cocktails. We're we were in New York at a Christmas party at a, you know, sitting at a bar actually, and, and, and we were talking about kind of the good old days when writers really knocked it back. And uh, his grandfather among them and others, Fitzgerald and Faulkner and O'Neill. And so out of that sort of sprang the idea of doing a book on hard drinking American writers. So we did that book. And it came out and uh, was a lot of fun and people seemed to enjoy it. And then we wanted to follow it up with something. And so we were kind of casting about for ideas. And I had, I, as you noted, I was a screenwriter. I am a screenwriter. And I'd moved out to Los Angeles at this point. And so we sort of landed on the idea of Hollywood and drinking. And we kind of grabbed a tiger by the tail. With as many memories as this place, of all the gin joints, packs in the Hollywood lore including other landmarks and their contributions to high spirits everywhere. The cock and bull, which was on Sunset, that they invented the Moscow mule. And that, you know, and that has kind of come back into currency. I mean, you see the Moscow mule a lot um, now. And 
there was a guy who, uh, who was there at the bar, an actor, a great character actor named Broderick Crawford, who used to, Broderick Crawford's favorite place to hang out was here, the Formosa. But, um, but he was, he was, he was that, that night at um, the Cock and Bull. And he was the first one to try the Moscow Mule. And he said it tasted good. It had a little kick to it. And so that's how the, you know, and then the, the name was born, the Moscow Mule, the drink with a velvet kick. Which leads us to another story involving a couple more gin joints, including the Formosa, and the infamous cast of Stanley Kramer's Not as a Stranger. And it started at Villa Capri, where a bunch of them are hanging out there. Um, uh, uh, Mitchum and, oh, and Lee Marvin as well, I believe. Uh, Mitchum and, and, and Sinatra and Lee Marvin are hanging out at Villa Capri, and jo Joe DiMaggio's there. And DiMaggio sort of is drowning his sorrows at the bar, right? He's, he's on the outs with Marilyn. Their marriage is falling apart, and he just wants to find Marilyn and talk to her and try and convince her, right? So, so he, he, and Sinatra's a pal of DiMaggio, so they're talking about that Sinatra says that he happens to know where Marilyn is, where she's staying, you know, that very evening. And so they hatched this plan, which later the newspapers would call the wrong door raid, and they, that they're going to go and they're going to find Marilyn at this apartment, and they're going to they're going to knock the door down, and they're going to give DiMaggio a chance to you know confront her and talk to her. So okay, you got to imagine there's a lot of booze that's going down as they're hatching this little plan. So then they're trying to figure out, well, who's big enough to knock the door down? And so they look to Mitchum, and Mitch is a big guy. And Mitchum says, you know, he doesn't know that he can do it, but they, they figure, well, Broad Crawford can do it. Broad was even bigger than Mitchum. So Broderick, they're like, oh, he's going to be hanging out at the Formosa. So they all get in the car and they go and they pick, a, they go to the, come here to the Formosa, they pick up Broad Crawford and then they go to the apartment. And, you know, the way it went down is basically Crawford goes up and he, boom, hammers the door and busts it down just like he's supposed to. And like these five of the you know, biggest movie stars in the world go stumbling into this apartment. Well, Sinatra had gotten the apartment wrong. And, um, you know, it's this old woman whose name was like Florence Coates. And she's this, you know, six-year-old woman who freaks out. I, you know, I don't know what she's thinking. She has six movie stars knock down her door, and kind of, or five movie and trample into the room. So, um, but that Marilyn was actually staying next door. Story upon story, some fun, some tragic, and some cautionary? A story I like involves William Holden, who's in the book. And the story is, is that uh, William Holden is, uh, he was pals with an actor that folks may remember named Dana Andrews, and with another actor who folks definitely will remember named Ronald Reagan. And the three of them were at a Screen Actors Guild meeting, and uh, after the meeting ended, they decided to go across the street and have dinner. And so they go across the street and they order a round of drinks and they all sit down and they start talking. And, you know, after about 10 minutes or so, the waiter comes back and he asks them if they'd like another round. And um, William Holden says, sure. And Dan Andrews says, sure. And Reagan looks at the two of them and says, you know, why are you ordering another drink? You just had one. And so years later, Dana Andrews would look back on the incident and point out, and see what happened? Bill and I became a couple of alcoholics, and Ronnie went on to become the President of the United States of America. <laughs> and so, um, one way to think of this book is that this book is really about the people that ordered that second drink and the third drink and, you know, didn't, didn't really stop there. So, um, it's been a lot of fun. It's a little early for the beverages to be flowing here yet, but they will. And you know there's a new food option here as well at the Kauffman Center. They've got the dining experience now, so you can eat on site before your symphony concert, mm -hmm. opera performance, and they've even got some country music coming. Oh, but we're going to leave you with some music of a different type, the kind that ushered out the record bar in Westport just a few weeks ago. Videographer John McGrath was on hand for the final few hours of this Kansas City musical mainstay. Until next time, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Maris Aylward. Thanks for watching. Hey, so I don't like to talk a lot about record bar, but I, all the staff that's working and all the ones that aren't working tonight, just know how much we owe you and we love you so much.
beautiful, lovely offices. And, uh, 